um, just to say, my name is Isan Holt, um, and um, I am um, here to be part of the conversation that explores the um, importance of the uh, LYC and Museum and Art Gallery, these Museum and Art Gallery in as it uh, existed in rural Cumbria between 1971 and 82, um, for as an opportunity for thinking about um, the possibilities of evolving, developing rural art structures, infrastructures in, in the present period, and how thinking about these practice might be of value for thinking about the importance of rural spaces, um, or spaces specifically as uh, separate from the centre. So when we begin to think about the centre, <laughs> Uh, the implication, therefore, is that the rural is marginal or peripheral. And one of my particular concerns um, has been an interest in rethinking these ideas about landscapes and environments which are considered to be at edge of marginal or peripheral in a negative context, and instead to see those kinds of environments as potentially very important generative spaces spaces of innovation, of experimentation, where new ways of thinking and being might be evaluated and, and developed. Um, so for me, thinking about Li Wan Chi and his geographical position is, is of interest. Uh, the, the LYC Museum um, as we, as an art gallery was in rural Cumbria, just below the border with Scotland, on the county line with Northumberland, uh, a place of a very particular rural environment with a long history of interactions across the border region, um, a, a, a hybrid place, if you like, of customs and traditions and engagement with the material resources of that landscape. And so to that extent, I think it's possible to think of this region, this border region, as a borderland, a place of interaction and mutual exchange. So I like to run with that idea and think about the possibilities and the opportunities of this geographical location as a place on the border, a place of mobility and exchange. You know, Lee's Museum and Art Gallery was located virtually atop of Hadrian's Wall. So there's a very interesting sense of, of the, the position there, its positionality. To think in those terms, geographically about its position, but also to think about this issue to do with borders and bordering and crossing borders conceptually as well as geographically. Um, and there, I think, we begin to see the importance of this particular location as a place for generatively crossing borders and boundaries and dissolving hierarchies, um, which I think was something which was very significant in terms of the, the establishment of the, um, the LYC. It was a place for uh, crossing borders between practices, between communities, dissolving hierarchies. It was a place which was open and inclusive in the, in the communities that it engaged with and the practices that it engaged with. So in that regard, uh, I think it has very particular relevance for thinking about contemporary art practices today. Um, and so, um, you know, the, the LYC was a place for for Lee moving to that part of rural Cumberland in the late 60s, early 70s, as we've been discussing as a place of uh, that offered time and space, a place of life, a place to connect and to build connections, to build bridges, I think would be one way that you might be able to think about it. Um, so, and that was in the context of the 1970s, which of course was a period of the rise of environmentalism, of, uh, of land art, of environmental art, and of a number of artists and craftspeople moving out into rural areas, moving into places, doing up dilapidated, derelict cottages, and, and developing practices with a very particular social and political and ethical and environmental interest, which brings us to now. So now the rest of this is about now. And I think it's at this point that we begin to see again what perhaps we might think of as something of a rural term. Um, so it would be interesting for us to think about the reasons why it has become the case that many artists are, are thinking and 
physically moving where, they, where it's able to, looking for strategies to work outside of the centre into rural spaces, not in the context of retreat, uh, but in the context of these are active places within which to work and within which perhaps to imagine other alternative ways of being and forms of existence. So in order to think about the implications of this, this positive new rural turn, uh, we have three uh, presentations which we're going to uh, go through now. But first, I'm going to, and I'll just briefly introduce the speakers, and then and then we'll have the three presentations, and then there'll be a bit of conversation around the connections that we might see, and then an opportunity for questions. And that's how we will proceed. And somebody is keeping an eye on the time. <laughs> okay, so. Um, to discuss these kind of possibilities, the, the generative possibilities of rural spaces then, uh, we have uh, the field, um, Dudley and Adam from the field, but other members of the field are here, an artist-led communal living project based in Shipley in Derbyshire. It's been operating since early 2021, so not long. Uh, and the project works to provide space and time for artistic self-development, exploring co-organization, reflection, experimentation, and connection, which is non-institutional, autonomous, and unfunded. Uh, Bella Milroy is an artist and writer who lives in the hometown of Chesterfield. Hello, Bella. <laughs> um, Derbyshire, and she works responsibly through mediums of sculpture, drawing, photography, text, writing, gardening, and curating. And she makes work um, about making work and being disabled, and about not making work and being disabled. And this is a process-based practice, which is fundamental to her as a disabled artist. And then Alma Josephine Budge uh, is a speculative writer, artist, curator, and pleasure activist, whose praxis navigates intimate explorations of race, art, ecology, and feminism, working to activate movements that catalyze human rights, environmental evolutions, and troublesomely queer identities. So we are going to begin Bella, with, with your presentation, and then we're going to move on to the field, and then we're going to move on to Amma, and then there'll be conversation after that. Hi, Bella. Um, hello, thank you so much for um, uh, that introduction, Isan. It's wonderful to be here with everybody today. Virtually, hybrid events are so uh, important um, and uh, make that an accessible experience for so many people. And um, my, my participation in today's programme possible. So thank you for that. Um, uh, yes, my name is Bella Milroy. I'm based in my hometown of Chesterfield in North Derbyshire, not far from the field. Um, uh, just a short visual description for myself. I'm a white woman in my early 30s. I've got a round face, with pale white skin and short brown hair, um, glasses. And behind me is a sofa with some blankets and some dogs wandering around from time to time. Um, I'm just going to begin sharing screen. Just bear with me. Uh, um, so, yes, as... Uh, Isan described my practice there personally. Um, my, my work spans lots of different mediums um, and uh, part of that is also uh, curating and programming uh, uh, primarily with uh, disabled artists. Um, I am deeply passionate about uh, contributing to the cataloguing of disabled artists uh, as a way of um, uh, furthering their work and showcasing their value and importance within the arts and also uh, and en endeavouring to create more accessible, uh, more enjoyable working experiences for disabled artists um, across industry. Um, the project I'm currently working on at the moment is uh, a program a program called Further Afield, which is really what brings me here today to be with you all talking about contemporary art making in, in rural spaces. And the program was developed in collaboration with Level Centre, who are a rurally based Arts Council, NPO and Disability Arts organisation based in Rosalie in Derbyshire, again, just down the road from me, um, a small village location. 
Um, and it was developed in a collaboration with them uh, across 2021, 2022. And the last year or so is now accumulating into a, a series of uh, primarily a series of interviews with uh, disabled artists who are either rurally based or have practices rooted in rural spaces. Um, and the programme also has a series of writers who respond to those conversations um, as a way of furthering the discussions. Um, it's a it's such an exciting place to explore uh, using uh, disabled uh, experiences and rurality as a lens to understand um, how art making occurs and uh, the nature of disabled artist practices as imaginative and um, uh, resourceful and um, just so valuable to be able to share that with audiences um, alongside the uh, kind of really kind of trying to subvert ideas of uh, and expectations of what kind of art exists in rural spaces who what kind of artists um make there um and who gets to who gets to exist in those spaces um so that's just kind of a little snapshot of the program that i'm currently working on and that will come to uh be launched in around april of this year so i'm really excited to be able to share this moment and also the future of that work in the next few months I'd just like to finish off um, this short introduction today um, and a kind of really helpful example of the kind of approach to um, the, this project in particular, and again, rurality and disability in this context. Um, this is a screenshot taken from the Garda website in 2023, and it depicts Garda's location on a map, keeping Garda at the centre. Um, this is a uh, something that I came across uh, in a uh, a talk that was hosted by AN in early in late 2021, early 2022, uh, which was presented by Garda um, by Daniel Clark of Garda, who is an art, uh, which is an artist led social enterprise uh, based on Borough Isle in Shetland. And um, what Daniel Clark did was present uh, Garda's location, um, but instead of uh, but created a, the conventional world map location of it upside down, with Garda's location at the centre. Um, this new reframing illustrated the ways in which Garda was not somewhere off in the distance, um, far away from other presumed centres like Edinburgh or London. In fact, it held its own centre and in doing so demonstrated it was far closer to other perhaps culturally unexpected locations like Bergen, Norway. It is not some remote, isolated satellite. It is part of a broader, interconnected place. I'm interested in how disabled artists exist, how they work, the work they make, the way they navigate the art world and the shared wisdom of disabled artist communities. When we facilitate access as a core embodiment of creative process and collaboration, it allows for us to recenter what would otherwise be at the edges. Thank you, San, for uh, demonstrating that at the beginning there. <laughs> In exploring the landscape of rural contemporary art making through this lens of disability, we can attempt to reconfigure the expanse of peripheral experiences, the personal, societal and geographical. Um, so I, I just think that's a really wonderful example there from Garda. Uh, this again, this is not the map that Daniel Clark used in that presentation, but a screenshot from the website that kind of references that um but yeah that's kind of uh really kind of encapsulates my approach to this kind of programming and what's so exciting about uh researching um uh this kind of work in rural spaces and what that what that means for contemporary art making i think it's a a really wonderful space to be thinking and talking about so really excited to be here today thank you Hello, thank you for the introduction. We are from the field, Adam and Dudley. Um, I'm gonna try and give you a quick rundown of everything that we are and that we do. It's quite expansive. So we'll do a bit of a whistle stop tour. Hopefully it gives you some pointers for questions later. Um, so the, the project came into being 
from the ashes of a so-called rural residency which was organized by a London-based arts organization and a property guardianship company. Um, faced with broken promises in a derelict building, the early residents cut ties with the arts organization and start to define the shape of the project themselves um, and dealing directly with the guardianship company as well. Um, the building we occupy, which is Michael House, um, started life as officers for the National Coal Board. We're right next to what used to be Shibley Colliery and later found use as a Steiner school. With these histories still echoing through the space and area now, we've got a wealth of indoor and outdoor space. Um, old classrooms have become bedrooms and studios. We've got a workroom, a theatre, a cinema, a kitchen, which has never struggled to accommodate even the largest of gatherings. Um, and then our outdoor space consists of the old playground and woodland areas where we've built um, quote unquote luxuries such as a fire pit and fire heated outdoor bath, which you might see on later slides. Um, we also exist on the edge of Shipley Country Park, which provides us some great access to the outdoors. Shipley itself is a village nestled between the towns of Ilkeston and Hena in Derbyshire. And it is bordered by Cotmany, noted as being in the top 1% of the country's most deprived areas, which feels important for us to mention in order to properly contextualize our existence. So whilst we don't necessarily consider our, like ourselves hard to reach physically, um, our location places us a bit out of the easy reach of development and commuter belts, allowing us to exist in a way that we don't imagine would be possible in the city. The space is currently home to eight long-term residents, uh, aged 27 to 35, including trans, gay, non-binary, disabled, POC, and working class individuals from the local area as well as further afield. Um, and this community is frequently bolstered by a number of short-term residents, as well as guests and visitors from our vast and varied circles who come over for dinner or a few hours or even a few weeks. The field is defined by the individuals who inhabit it, existing in some soft flux with the ebb and flow of people coming and going, whether that's long term or short term. What it is now is not what it might be next year, and definitely not what it was last year. It's held many identities without striving to overly resolve into something fixed. I think it's fair to say that this process is the outcome in and of itself. Organisationally, we hold weekly meetings to discuss general business and often have further gatherings to work on the intentions and the planning behind what we do. And we also host monthly crits, inviting artists from nearby cities to join us. Uh, and we often work together towards opportunities like today, as well as exhibitions and workshops. Besides this, we exist together in the day to day, um, cooking and eating together, spending time together, invested in one another's lives as friends first and artists second. So before coming to Wisin, we met a couple of times as a group to, con um, to consider what, might, what we might want to say about what our life at the field affords us. And instead of trying to reauthor those conversations too much, I thought I would finish just by reading some of the notes that were taken in those meetings. So some things that the space offers are a chance to reconsider why you make and how you make in a way that wouldn't happen living on autopilot in the city. The ability to meet people in a space where you're not prioritizing networking, mental space, physical space and outdoor space. The possibility to live with your work, particularly from a disabled perspective, a place where you can live what you write about and dream about in the city that enables you to bring that into the everyday and a closeness to resting guilt-free, which we also feel is not accessible in the city. Then some things the space is or is not. It's opt-in, not opt-out. The social obligation at the field is different to what you would experience existing in a city's art scene, perhaps. It's not prioritizing artistic productivity over mental health. It's not driven by an outcome, but by the process and the experience. It is living with each other as a practice. There is no choice but to be invested in one another. It's not opportuni opportunistic or competitive, and it is a space for comfortable critique. And then finally, some things that we learn or live at the field are 
interdependence, not codependence, being forced to overcome productivity, the intensity of being, living and working together, and the level of communication that this requires, engaging with a need to survive as artists and people, despite the current climate, um, through living at the field, living with the knowledge that the situation that we're in is temporary, but embracing that and working to bring it to life regardless, knowing that the idea of friendship is limited, as all ideas are, but it is the most useful tool for us at the moment for connecting, developing our practices and broadening networks, and the idea that it's hard to write a recipe for something that we are in the throes of. That is a bit about the field. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit and then I'm going to read a little bit and hopefully I'm going to do it all in five minutes. Um, so, yeah, my name is Amma and I have a kind of interdisciplinary practice. So I think I'm about, I have an art making practice, I have a speculative writing practice. I have a research kind of practice or a kind of a reluctant, <laughs> reluctantly academic practice. Um, and then I also have a teaching practice. Um, and throughout all these practices, I think about what I've termed intimate ecologies. Um, so ways in which blackness meets the more than human in intimate, erotic and sensual ways and ways in which speculative thinking, so thinking speculatively and also utilizing methods and approaches such as science fiction writing, um, queer poetic writing, auto theory writing, um, and also what Stia Hartman has called um, critical fabulation, uh, can kind of bring into being some of these relations in ways that they're really, really difficult to, to trace tangibly, um, to articulate, especially in English. Um, and so I kind of trace these intimate ecologies through speculative writing, but also through looking at various art, artworks um, by other black artists and thinking about how these intimate relations can be traced visually and um, orally through storytelling in ways that they can't be kind of written down or recorded within the academy um, so that they remain kind of slippery um, and evasive to, to colonial <laughs> capture, basically. So when I thought about responding to this question of the rural, I mean, I live and was born in London um, until the age of nine and then moved to Accra in Ghana, so two capital cities. Um, but my one half of my family is from the southwest, so Devon, uh, particularly Devon, and then Cornwall, and then Dorset. And so I had a consistent relationship with um, those rural spaces, seaside towns, um, Sholden and Devon, for anyone who knows it, very much kind of traditionally a newlywed, nearly dead town, as they call them. Um, and I was the only uh, black or of color child that I ever remember seeing all throughout my childhood there. And I was known as John's granddaughter and everybody knew who I was. And to this day, people come up to me and everybody knows who I am because I'm the only one they saw. Um, so I had, and this is my granddad's tie. So this was my object that I bought uh, to think about my relationships to the rural. And I, and I loved it. I've had, always had a deep, deep love of, of, of being by the sea, of, of walking the moors, of we moved to Cornwall when I was 12 and, um, and I planted witch hazel gardens and had a very like deep kind of spiritual relationship, I think, with that, that kind of coastline. Um, but very much had to leave my blackness behind, I think, to be in those spaces in any kind of way. So through this research and, and my work, I guess, and this question, I was thinking about like, what are the ways in which blackness in, in the UK is made a rural site? and particularly black queerness is made a rural site and that it's never central, it's always marginal and it's always um, difficult to trace, right? We can we kind of trace it visually, but then, oh, they're, they're passing through, they're temporary, they're not kind of, they're never like a, a cultural historical center, even though of course we are um, in many, many ways, but it's very difficult to trace those kinds of archives. Um, and I think that that kind of idea of thinking about the ways in which certain kind of bodies are made rural, regardless of where they're placed, has been very recurrent in my experience of being in the UK when I, I went to my undergrad in Glasgow and I was the only black person in my whole university for the first two years. Um, 
and which was really fun um and it very much felt like a kind of strangely rural site even though Glasgow is a massive you know massive happening city so I think I, I've been thinking a little about this um so so where might a center of kind of blackness be be located um if one was to think about that and kind of other part of my research um traces my kind of lineage back to Ghana, where my uh, the other half of my family are from and where I moved when I was nine. And, and in Ghana, as in many global majority places, we don't have the same kind of binary between urban and, and rural or what, we, what in Ghana we would call the bush. Um, we don't have the same kind of economic um, or even like uh, spiritual or cosmological binaries. Um, there's a huge kind of going back and forth. Children are sent back and forth to, to friends or siblings or people who can afford to raise them or who live near a school. Um, money is sent back and forth. Goods are sent back and forth. So there's really a kind of much more of a, and people will often then go home for, for certain ceremonies or rituals or rites of passage. So that's also been very present in my, in my work. And of course, in my PhD, my supervisors would consistently therefore ask me, well, where's the site? of your research, right? Because um, when you're kind of in the social sciences, you have to demarcate a geographical site where you're, you're studying. And I really kept pushing back against this because I said, well, I want to talk about this Barbadian artist and I want to talk about this Kenyan collective and I want to talk about my work I'm doing in London and, you know, and all these, these are interconnected sites where I trace intimate ecologies. So I came up with this idea um, uh, of, of liquid landscapes, which is really what I want to kind of bring as a challenge to, to the idea of the rural. And I'm going to really quickly just read the kind of two, three paragraphs where I introduce this idea. So I apologize if I'm now going to disappear a little bit into slightly more obscure speak, but that is also a tactic, I would say. In this work, my PhD, I trace intimate ecologies wherever and whenever they can be found encompassing both a before colonization, quote unquote, but one that is now inextricable from the passages, transits and transformations that have followed and are still following. In other words, within these non-linear temporalities and unbordered geographies, I find ways to trace blacknesses for whom there is no after and no before in the now. Once freed, or at least on the way to being so, from this analytical framework in which one has to find a particular site, it became obvious that my sites were aesthetic, speculative, affective, and spiritual, as well as discursive. Intimate ecologies then become visible, um, became visible, uh, become visible in that they're both deliberately disparate scattered by colonial occupation, their missionary projects and enslavement, and deliberately embedded, encoded into the body, my body, into memory, into arts, and into rituals in order to survive. And where even the body has proved too permeable a host, they are remembered by our more than human companion species, our alter life kin, our interdependent ecologies. I think that the site of intimate ecologies then is figured into a liquid landscape, a transoceanic cartography with tides and currents that shift and flow, that is multitudinous and abundant, but also fragile and transtemporal. Liquid landscapes enable me not only to think of the site across borders, but also across lines of colonial oppression in tender, capacious and nuanced ways that do not discount the violences of difference imposed by those same colonial structures, but also create worlds in which cross-pollination becomes possible. So I really resonate with a lot of kind of things that have been shared and particularly kind of Bella's reference to, I love this um, remapping or re-cartographizing of this island as central. <laughs> So, um, yeah, and, and I think that really figures into this idea of a transoceanic map as opposed to a transborder or a transnational map that centers the ocean as this um, site of interconnectivity as opposed to um, bodies of land that are bordered as sites of interconnectivity. So I can talk more about that, but that's kind of where I'm coming from.
just just to um, just to pick up on some of the overall themes that have emerged here. I mean, obviously, a really key theme about this issue about who belongs in the rural and the problems about existing within rural spaces, because we've been talking um, very positively about issues to do with the, the, the kind of the advantages, the benefits of being within rural spaces in terms of connectivity, building connectivity, for being able to forge new forms of coexistence, um, being co-productive, lots of C's, co-production, collaboration, um, and in very positive terms, but I think there are also these questions about the difficulties of being in rural spaces, which I think we need to address here too. Um, and some of the kind of, uh, so moving away from this question of the imperatives to move out of the city, um, and we've addressed that in the context of, you know, the, the, the increasing difficulty for artists trying to exist and, and practice in, in urban centres these days, and therefore the, the, um, the, the pull towards this moving out of the city into rural spaces in, in, as part of a rural turn, but at the same time, the, the difficulties that can be experienced as being in the rural. We have to think about what do we mean by the rural? The rural is multiple and diverse, it's complex, it's contested. Um, and I just thought it would be interesting if perhaps you might share some of that experience before we move on to a different set of questions. Is it, so the, this, the, the problematics of the, of the, the rural term. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that it's uh, worst and best qualities are the same qualities, like the fact that it's totally ungentrified and um, is creates lots of problems. And if you go on a dating app and the only people on it are in your house, it's, um, <laughs> it's, not, it's not good. <laughs> and, um, so it's hard being queer in the countryside. And, yeah. um, <laughs> and uh, on, a, on a more serious note, like um, being disabled, you know, it's if you are sick, uh, as I've been multiple times, and you're too sick to get three buses to the hospital, um, you, you're going you're gonna to lose thirty pounds each way for a taxi, and like, things like that just make it so pro prohibitively difficult. And like most of the time, it's great because it's you know you can feel it every time you go outside. It's like it's so good for your body and stuff like that. And then there's these moments where it like flips, and when it flips, it's it's a lot more difficult than than it is in the city. And yeah, it's difficult to get support and things like that. Bella, is this something that you could expand on a little in terms of your own experience? Um, yeah, I think, um, yeah, thank you, Dudley. That was really, uh, really great to start off this this secondary chat of the um, of the panel. Um, yeah, I think uh, there's um, what's so what's so interesting, and like you say, Esan, the kind of uh, mult multiplicity of virality. And I loved what Emma was saying about that kind of liquid landscape is is that's such a fantastic terminology to capture capture that fluidity of of the space like that. And I think what's so um exciting about having these kinds of conversations with um artists and art organizations who are who are kind of uh, based rurally is that kind of fluidity of the space. And as I say, Chesterfield is I often describe as being kind of rural adjacent um, in that respect, that it is part of a uh, rural culture, rural landscape, uh, but as a large town, um, is doesn't face the same kind of uh, infrastructural challenges that Dudley just talks about in that way. Um, so, yeah, I think those kinds of, but but also if, if I think about the kind of uh, cultural barriers to um kind of contemporary art practices and contemporary art making in that way there are there are lots of like really similar barriers to um more more remote settings even in a large town like this uh for lots of reasons um and uh, i think yeah that's what's so what's so great about getting to talk to uh so many different people from so many different kind of areas of rurality is that kind of cross-sectional that trans geographical experience um, those quite a lot of the conversations we're having are, are from, are, are, of people who are either from rural who who live um, in cities and then are returning again to different kind of rural spaces um, and the different kind of challenges and barriers and uh, opportunities that that presents as, as well that again there's kind of 
lamination and layering that goes on in those kinds of experiences um like that is is yeah really 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 interesting um yeah Amma, did you want to yeah i was just gonna say i think coming back on um dudley's point of like the best qualities are also the, the worst qualities are also that can be the best qualities um i am planning to leave leave babylon as it were to leave <laughs> london um in a couple of years and one of the massive pulls for me is also having that thing where everybody knows who you are <laughs> and 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 being able to like therefore negotiate a particular set of relations with a particular set of humans which means that they you know do do then potentially because you're completely you know reliant on who those humans are but you they do then potentially become a community who you can call on in moments of dire need and are much much le much more likely to drive you if you need to be driven somewhere when you're ill or to bring you over soup or you know to and 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 that very much is like how i grew up in, in accra was very much as part of a really intimately knit community um so i guess i just wanted to kind of share living in like a super gentle i mean i live in uh, just down from dawston and for any of you who know northeast london it's like an insane site of gentrification it's absolutely devastatingly ruined my area and when things happen there's very few people who are still there even though i have lived there since i was a kid um who i would call on right and the people who are there are the few upper and upper middle class white people who bought up in the 80s are kind of the people who are still there so i think like just to kind of also put in that i do think i think that sense of isolation absolutely also happens in these in these cities and we see people who are consistently left behind and isolated we saw that consistently throughout the pandemic or, or it was like more visible throughout the pandemic but it's happening all the time um my granddad being a good example of like everybody who he knows or knew in shoulder would come and when his second wife died would take him out every other day to the pub for lunch they got his shopping you know it was like that would really would be hard pushed to find that in london unless you lived in like a gated community so i think that there are possibilities um but it can also be terrible <laughs> yeah again i don't really believe in that rural urban binary yeah. being a blanket term for any of these ways in which we think about building community i guess <clears throat> I mean, we, we need to constantly be conscious of the sense that the rural and the urban are always intricately interconnected mm. um, and because there could be a tendency to kind of fall back into those kinds of old binaries mm. and polarities all too easily. And I think um, I think one, one way as well to, to think about uh, to get over that those kind of false binaries as well is to go back to I'm sorry, I'm banging on about crossing borders all the time, but to to think about maybe a kind of a sense of ecological attunement um, as well. So the, the notion of thinking across species, thinking across the human and, and the non-human in ways which uh, can be very generative and, and, and are crucial, and particularly at this particular time of climate emergency, thinking about environmental concerns, you know, going back, you see a lot of resonance again with that period of the 1970s. But, but the urgency is even ever greater now and, and more important than ever to, to think. And when you're talking about intimate ecologies, the ways that we can you know, practice and think ra around these kinds of distinctions between, between the human and, and the non-human and of species and habitats and other ways of striving towards more sustainable futures, um, because it's, it's vital that we, that we think in those terms. Um, and so again, you know, it's, it's the rural turn seems to be um, increasingly consequential, um, despite all of the, you know, the, the issues that it can create, the problems that it can. Can I ask, can I ask you guys a question on that? So I really love that, that you said, um, Adam, at the end, you said this thing about it, like knowing that it was temporary, but, and I love that, that like, as opposed to knowing that it was precarious, Right, like I thought like that was a really important distinction. So, do you, but do you feel like there is like a long term possibility of this like sustainable, like future being lived at the field? Yeah. Yes. I think, I, think um, I don't know what form that would take. Whether we would still be in the field, whether that would you know be the community existing somewhere else. 
Is that better? Yeah. Um, yeah, whether that would be the community existing in the field long term by some short miracle or taking the intention that we've developed and moving that elsewhere. Um, I think there is definitely becoming more of a precedent for it. Um, like has been said, you know, there, there's definitely that turn towards the rural now. Um, and I don't think there's any point in us stopping in that. I think we are maybe on the right track. I think you say about it a lot, like the idea that cities are dead maybe, and that artists might be moving away from that sort of idea of the city now, which maybe you want to talk more about. Yeah, I mean, it's just a theory, but um, I think that people went, people left their towns and stuff and they left the areas they were in to go to cities um, to find other artists and empty spaces to because there was space to be creative and now it's like cities mean a totally different thing now and um what the feeling that i had when i arrived at the field was reminding me of the feeling that people talked about of going to new york when it was derelict in the 60s 70s and 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 how much everyone's practices have developed so fast by having that physical space to to, to so your mind can be free to do it to expand in all the directions it wants to and i want everyone to remember that have that feeling because it's really lost you know i think at this point we can invite some i don't know, I don't know how we're doing time. We've got about 10 15 minutes so this is a time for, for questions for anyone who'd like to ask any questions we need to this one doesn't work let's see if it works one. I think maybe like is, is it the green mic? This one. Lovely tech people. It's broken. Cool. Fine. Thank you. Hi. Hi everyone. Thank you so so much. Um, I have more of kind of a, a thought that's bubbling. I guess I've been writing about like the ethics of friendship when it comes to art and critique um, since around 2018. So it's nice to see that it's coming to fruition. Um, but I guess how, what I'm thinking is how, when you're living in the city, if you don't like your group of friends, you can kind of just find a new clique. Whereas in the rural, you, and, and you know, field is kind of, um, you're talking about it, that you actually have to live with those people and, how, how do you stop it becoming constant critique? Um, and on top of that, I guess what I'm thinking at work at the moment, we're thinking, I work for Unlimited, we're a disabled um, team in the programme team. And we're thinking about when access has to trump eco um, needs, I guess, or sustainability. So I guess, yeah, how, how do you stop yourself from it becoming a constant critique and a almost a policing of each other, I guess, when you're artists living, critiquing each other's work and friends, mm -hmm. um, and you don't have the luxury of saying, look, I'm just gonna distance myself, I'm, I'm in it now. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's just a bit more a ramble and a thought, a thought bubbling, mm -hmm. thanks. Yeah, I think I can answer that. So some people have come and said that um, that who have been like initially resistant to having their work critiqued have felt like they could receive critique at the space because we care about people, we care about them as like human beings and their survival and we give them a place to sleep and food to eat and um, it's like not conditional in the way that you know if you go to a university the next day when you finish your degree they're going to throw your work in the bin if you don't get rid of it. And we're not, we're, so the whole approach and feeling of it is, is different. Mm -hmm. And we've built up the, our, the bond slowly. Like it's taken like a, a year and a half to, to get to a point where we understand everyone's position to build this group and create this thing without leaving people behind. And that's just through meeting once a week without having to fix anything, just to have that, that conversation. And it's, you know, it's like a loose sort of, um, what's it called, like consensus. And it's it's just slowly, it takes time to understand what people are about. And we're like at that stage now. And um, it's a really good like place to be. So I d it doesn't feel stressful at all. Yeah. I think you said about, um, you know, in, in the city, 
if you're not getting along with your group of friends, you can just go and find a new group of friends. Um, you know, we, we, we don't, we can't, I suppose we could if we really wanted to leave the field, but we're not going to do that. So, we, you know, we can't leave that friendship group. And when you said that, it makes me, or it, it made me think that perhaps that is when friendship turns into community. Um, you know, so community, I guess, is more than just people you are friends with. You don't necessarily have to always be friends with people in your community for them to be part of your community. So, that, you know, that, that constant presence with each other um, and knowing that you have to coexist forces you to become better at that um, and take that somewhere further, maybe. And I'd just say that, like, we kind of have about 80% attendance on everything that we do, and it's everybody knows that everyone's going to miss some stuff, so there's no there's no responsibility to have to do anything. It's just like an opt-in sort of thing, so it's really relaxed as well. Yeah, I just also, Bella, I, I don't want you to feel left out, so I'm a bit, is, I just listen in quickly, but I just, I, I feel like this is such an important question because it's also, it's about cancel culture also, right? It's about like getting into a culture of discarding people when things become hard or people mess up or disagreements are had. Um, and that absolutely also happens in the city, right? I don't know. I mean, I definitely lot, had a massive losing of my community about six years ago that was utterly devastating. I didn't feel like there was another one um, for me. And so I think it's I think it's about cancel culture. And then I also just want to say something about um, one. I'm a massive fan of the feminist science fiction writer Ursula K. Le Guin. And in one of her early interviews, um, she was asked if there was an overall theme about what your writing is about, what, what is it? And her like snap response was marriage, which is so weird, right? <laughs> and then like she did this talk about it like, ten, like I don't know, 20 years later, she's a person who reflected a lot on her own work because she had such a long career. She said that was a really weird thing to respond, but I really think it's true in that it's really about like these long term relations with with between peoples species aliens communities individuals and how you work through massive challenges and as someone who has for better or worse i mean for better but you know for worse in terms of the system being fucked up gotten married to my wife i really feel that like I consistently come up against thinking through, I have learned so much in how do I live with this person through a global pandemic, through a death, through loss of family members, through being disowned by various people, through loss of housing, like through loss of community. How do you stay with someone and that someone might be a community that might be a, a, an animal who gets sick, for example, in our case, how do you live through that and work through that without discarding each other? And I and I, so I, I kept thinking back to this Ursula K. Le Guin thing about about marriage, and that for me feels like a really exciting queer invitation to something that we might not call marriage, but we might think of as a kind of interspecies and intercommunity marriage, also as a way of staying with and not throwing away. That that was amazing. I loved that. Um, uh, what a fantastic kind of uh, thread. To, to find in, in in this discussion that but thank you so much Emma um yeah and, and I think there's I I totally agree I think there's something um and it's kind of what uh Dudley and Adam were talking about in the field and it's something that um as a as a sick disabled artist my entire I the way I experience the world is is through that body and the limitations and the crampedness of that body and the space and the, the limitations and the crampedness of the space in which I exist. And I, I guess there's something about um, when you're talking, when um, the field were talking about kind of that kind of uh, initial um, kind of uh, uh, ecology of, of community like that. Um, it's almost kind of written down uh, bodies in the building or bodies in the site take the precedent over output. Um, and I think um, I think that's where these conversations about uh, rurality and, and uh, art making and artists uh, existing uh, and like working in collaboration with those spaces. Th those are really interesting kind of things to uh, to to kind of 
think about in that way and, and I think that's where you know working with disabled artists is so exciting and like that because you know and you know beyond that, that again disabled that rooted in disability justice practice but but you know the the reminder as um you know one of Caroline Caroline Lazard's fantastic texts uh, that you know every, everybody has needs and um uh you know the 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 body and the sight taking precedent over output feels like that's a really um a beautiful kind of uh, way of capturing um a different kind of way of connecting creatively both with each other and with uh, the possibility for for making art as well Isang, can I contribute some there's some questions and comments from our online audience yes, and um, you can see um, I think here we can see there's like 57 um, kind of comments in the chat so just for the panelists to know that um, your your ideas are also sparking off other conversations <coughs> that are happening online but just to contribute a few of those to the room um, Amanda makes a comment about how um, the landscape of the rural has changed quite radically since the pandemic especially with like the move of people out of towns and cities and buying rural homes and again that pressure on the infrastructures of trains connections and housing and making those places unaffordable to many people now um, and then um, Joe um, makes a comment about um, yeah difficulties of living in rural spaces especially I think this as Anne connects to your um, comment about uh, the climate emergency and Joe's base in the Dales um, as well and, and about flooding mm. continuously and I think again uh, for getting here today many of us will have noticed that pressure of water um, on the landscape and uh, Joe says if, if things carry on no one will be able to live here sadly only the wealthiest who are able to kind of protect those spaces and and, and make them um, uh, habitable again um and again so and just a lot there's a, a lot of uh, back and forth in chat so there's a generative conversation happening online so i just wanted to make sure um some of those comments um and voices were were heard in this yes. space as and, well and sarah will it be possible for the panel to see those comments a bit later on if yeah we'll we'll down i think we can download the download chat them. can't we and, yeah. and add those to the that, to the recording yes yeah, so thank you everyone online mm -hmm. um and we can't um, add all those comments in but we will kind of yeah. record them and make yeah. sure uh, people have chance to read them one more question we, we've probably got time for one more question if, if anyone two hands here can we have the both uh, questions then we can answer like one each yeah mm -hmm. or yeah sure yeah. Um, I was just curious as well about the question of spatial non-justice in the rural spaces and the fact that most of it isn't even under public ownership, but it's under like the 1%. And I'm just curious how you will come up against that and how you deal with that. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's it. Um, yeah, my question was how you think the boundary between the rural and city is changing, um, like by taking into account kind of the history of um, their kind of co-development, um, the, the rural as like the fringes of the markets, um, you know, towns kind of formed around markets, and the idea was that there was like a kind of a life underneath the market, right, where you could subsist, um, but then of course, with this sort of subsumption of the well, first land entered the market and is now owned in much more concentrated hands. And then, um, of course, like the money market, uh, uh, you know, is pervasive. Um, the city became the place for the concentration of industry. And then you have the countryside as a space which reproduces that through material extraction. Um, but coming up to today, where uh, are we even in a capitalist market anymore or something else is kind of the questions that we're having, you know, right, techno-feudalism. So what is the boundary between rural and city today? <laughs> um, yeah, I kind of wanted to mention this before in an earlier point, but um, I, I can't answer for everyone, obviously, but... Um, um, I, I just know that we couldn't exist without each other in the house in a, living in a communal way um, and we also couldn't exist without our connections to other people in other cities and um, those connections have like developed over the residences we've met a lot of people from over the UK and um, we've got people coming from we've had people from America we've got some people coming from like as far as Japan and stuff like that and so it's not 
um, it's just yeah it, it we're just we're, we're we rely on so many other things and then we obviously rely, rely on the internet and we're not i don't feel that we're separate at all we're like you know we're, we're in relationship to it and it kind of reminds me of when people might talk about how i mean i heard that the summer holidays were created so that uh, working class people could go and work in the in the fields and that they had that time where they left london or left the city and um and yeah, so I see us as, as, as trying to connect people in the cities to the countryside and, and them connecting us to the cities and it's like a, um, and helping conversations grow as well. Around that. Maybe in addition to that, what I was thinking when you were asking that question was, for me at least, it seems like the boundary between cities and the rural is becoming much more permeable. Maybe it's only like that to me now because I've moved into the rural and I'm forced to create some permeability between the fact that I live rurally but sort of work in the city. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I have much more of a point than that. Just, yeah, it seems like it's becoming more permeable. Um, maybe, maybe that is also linked to what you said about, you know, post COVID people moving out of the cities, working remotely. Um, but I think there is, you know, that there's a positive side to that in, you know, like how, how we have moved away from the city. Yeah, just a, a small thought. That's what I was thinking about um, throughout this is also like this, this point about class and, and who gets to move out, right? And like, I'm really glad this point of privatization was brought up because like one of the things that nobody talks about is a lot of people, not in this case of the field, but most people that I know, artists and creatives who are moving out, are moving out and buying up cheap housing, right? Cheap compared to being in, a, in like a, a major city and still buying up cheap housing based on like family, family inherited wealth, predominantly inherited wealth or wealth that's come through like corporate working. Um, and that is changing those those towns and, and cities and pieces of land. And that is a form of gentrification, right? So that, that like St. Leonard's, where I'm thinking about moving, for example, is totally being gentrified by like white queer people moving from London. Um, and, and, and that's, and it's, it's amazing because I go there and then there's loads of queer people and there are people of color, but, but also it's shit because it means that, you know, now everything's really expensive and for people who lived there before. So just to kind of bring that up that again, to like trouble that kind of, sense of like moving out um, is becoming a part of gentrification. And I also just want to speak to like also a large number of people of colour in, in, in rural and or non large city spaces are also migrant communities who've been placed there, um, often like unconsensually. Um, and one of the reasons why I kind of think about intimate ecologies is because black people's um, relationships with the rural in the West are often through institutionalization, whether that's through um, the prison system and being incarcerated in the countryside, whether that's through detention centers, or whether that's through being placed um, as migrant and asylum communities in, in kind of random pieces of housing um, in random parts of the country um, without any kind of sense of agency or any kind of like real, real relation to also like massively racist sentiments in some of those places. So just to kind of like, I think there's lots of lots of things that, are, that are, it's really important to keep troubling um, about the move out, um, the mass exodus, um, and who, who gets to do it by choice. Um, yeah. Do you want to go back to Bella? Yeah, yeah. Bella, did you want to have the last word at this point? Oh, yeah, just kind of drawing on what, what everybody's just shared there, in, in, um, and it really, yeah, it's kind of a bit like what Dudley was saying at the start of kind of like the, the best bits and the worst bits uh, that kind of um, permeability across geographies um, and that kind of uh, um, the fluidity of of of, uh, of of geographies in that in that way um, uh, something that I definitely uh, relate to in the, that even though like I say my town is a large town in a rural uh, kind of landscape it's uh, also uh, not one where I I live with my peers I don't I don't have my peers in the place where I live and that can be really isolating um, and the permeability that I have found through um, what the internet has been able to offer um, really kind of uh, uh, reduces some of those uh, barriers as well um, 
And then I am still met with the reality of not living in the same place as my peers. And I think, um, yeah, I, I, it's just something I think, yeah, all of all of you were, were kind of drawing upon those kinds of uh, the, uh, um, the problems uh, of of that kind of the cross geographies that, that occur and then the realities of uh, existing in those spaces as well. Um, and um, I think what's so wonderful about kind of working on projects like Further Afield and talking to uh, those wonderful artists that and uh, disabled artists, sick artists that are making really important, fantastic work in these spaces is that kind of uh, the feeling that I, I never feel like I'm wanting to like discover these artists. It's just, it's wanting to kind of like, uh, like, uh, kind of um, shake people into kind of like it's all here it's all happening all of this amazing stuff is 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 happening and it's merely a kind of connecting the dots together um, as a way of kind of like strengthening uh, that that kind of connect uh, cross geography cross, cross geographical connection like that because I think particularly within disabled context it's it's really hard when it is just you out there you know <laughs> and that kind of sense of wanting to kind of bring that uh, virtual community into in person which is what's so interesting about what the field are doing um yeah i think uh yeah as study said at the beginning the best bits are often the worst bits as well and um yeah okay we're going to draw this conversation to a close now. Um, I think it was a really rich conversation and thank you very much for all of your contributions. I think the kind of endless sort of um, issue of, of negotiating the distinctions between the rural and the urban, the centre and the periphery continues, but it's like I say, it's an ever more urgent context within which we're operating in which I think artists do have a very powerful potential role to play and I think it takes us back to the value of Li Wan Chi as well and his moment in the 1970s and early 80s. Thank you so much to everybody. Thank you Bella. Thank you The Field. Thank you Anna. Thank you.